So what causes abnormal deformation of proteins and how does it relate to these abnormal clots that we are now seeing with this post, post interaction with the spike protein? <laughs> and this is serious topic at a real fun spot because <laughs> look at all the cool balloons. This is going to be the topic of today's video part three in a series on abnormal clotting due to COVID. My name is Dr. Mikola Rashik of Moro Genomics, and let's get started. All right, so I already made a couple videos giving background on, on how and why we're getting these abnormal, abnormal clots. So let's talk about the definition of these, of what are we talking about abnormal and what is amyloidosis? So what are amyloid proteins? Basically, why proteins get deformed? So these authors who are researching this information, they've discovered this a while back already that certain, at some, some situations you can have these abnormal clots. But this is very obscure observation that, that, um, that they discovered. And therefore, no one really paid attention. But incredibly enough, they also saw that these abnormal clots is something that is actually com potentially commonly observed in long COVID. And so let's talk about why proteins get deformed and what are we talking about? in terms of a family of amyloidosis proteins. So proteins, as I already mentioned in the previous video, normally are made out of amino acids that are linked together in a one long chain. And then that long chain adopts a certain three-dimensional conformation. Basically, amino acids can interact together, together with each other via electrostatic interactions and these interactions allow these amino acids to adopt three-dimensional structures. So it's been always assumed that these three-dimensional structures that proteins adopt, when they adopt these, these structures, they require the lowest amount of energy. Intuitively, that makes sense because obviously you want to use as little energy as possible when, when you're building something. And the reason why this was thought is because if you subsequently deform the protein, so misshape it, so you no longer have the three-dimensional shape, this is also called denaturation. So if you denature the protein, it will then revert back always to its original state. So it's, it was assumed that therefore that original state had to require the least amount of energy in order for it to be produced. There's another balloon being getting ready for, for a liftoff. <laughs> this is so much fun. How, however, this turned out not to be the case once prion proteins were discovered. So prion proteins are really interesting because it turned out that prion proteins, they can have another shape. They were able to adopt different shape that required more energy, a lot more energy than normally, than the native protein, the protein that typically is found. And however, once it, that protein adopts that shape, adopted that shape, it was really stable. It was actually more stable and, and a, and a better fit protein than the original native form. So this role and this protein, prion proteins that required more energy, basically they were like rogue proteins. And the interesting part, and this is really a big surprise at the time, is that the rogue proteins themselves were capable of inducing that change in other prion proteins. Prion proteins, are known for causing diseases and the most famous cases, remember the met cow disease? I've been mentioning this 
few times and basically the disease itself is caused because of these abnormally shaped proteins where the proteins themselves can induce that that shape once they become rogues so it's like a chain reaction now since then it was discovered that this type of misshapen proteins can play a role in many diseases there's at least at least 50 of these different proteins according to the summary provided by the authors and some of the examples i already mentioned alzheimer's another one is parkinson's another one that and of course this surprised me was uh, this can also play a role in type 2 diabetes rheumatoid arthritis and then also another example that might sound familiar to you is preeclampsia which is a condition in pregnancy that uh, co potentially causes issues with uh, with um, blood pressure so what happens with these proteins though they're characterized by a similar pattern which is why they are defined as amyloid and when you have a single chain of amino acids put together that eventually is supposed to start adopting three-dimensional shape when these amino acids interact with one another pretty much to my knowledge there's only three things that can happen when amino acids adopt a certain shape so number one they can start creating helixes this is called they are these these three-dimensional structures are called alpha helixes and basically it's just like a helix in the dna so that's one thing another one is they can start making sheets they're called beta sheets and these sheets basically like lines can stack on top of each other or be next to one another so that's another possibility these beta sheets and the last one is simply they can uh, they can be without any form so they will literally just be a loop of chain of amino acids just that can flop about and be flexible as a consequence okay so in amyloid proteins what what these what these proteins are achieving they're building these beta beta sheet structures and they're stacking on top of each other and basically that's what that's what they form that is abnormal when amyloid proteins form their structures and remember in the last video when i mentioned that you can take a certain molecule called thioflavin t and and um, interacted with uh, with um, amyloid proteins to make it fluoresce that's where the molecule gets in it gets in in between the amino acids in those beta sheets and that's where you start causing fluorescence and this is how you can identify amyloid proteins these proteins that adopt these structures and are becoming misshapen so that's that's a little bit of a background on on amyloidosis and typically these rogue proteins usually once they adopt the shape they're very very stable so they're more stable than in its original native form and oftentimes it's just like one type of protein that participates in in uh, in this process and they can start interacting with each other so one protein can start interacting with another and they can start assembling together and this is what appears to be happening as well in this case with those clots however others also mentioned that this is not a typical experience there's not a typical experience um, to have amyloid amyloid structures when it comes to blood so they even mentioned that this might be somewhat unusual 
This might be somewhat unusual um, f for blood to actually have, have this uh, formation and therefore it might be somewhat confusing. As a consequence, the authors propose that a new name for, for this and I believe they, they coined a new term and decided to call these abnormal clots fibrinoloids because blood typically is not associated with amyloid diseases. So that's something that is really new. And normally with the clots, when you do form clots, what you actually form is what I like, I like how the authors described it. Basically they were mentioning what you normally form is, and there go balloons, there's only one left. So we're gonna see one more rise. Is um, when you form clots with fibrin, what you're really causing is something like a, a, a plate of spaghetti. So the typically clots are defined by, by the size as well as the type of holes that, that you have in between, like let's say the, the noodles of spaghetti. Of course, the spaghetti noodles are formed by are formed by the fibrin linked chains together. Okay. But when you have it, when you have these abnormal clots, you no longer have, you no longer have that normal spaghetti looking clots. It's much more denser than that. Basically what's happening is, is it's, much more clamped together. So that's one of the ways uh, of, of uh, defining what these clots would look like. And, and as I mentioned in the previous video, as a consequence, they're also much more resistant to degradation. Okay, so that's one, one of those features. And in this particular review, that was used for for making of this video they also showed more more of these clots and then might as well show this as well so you can see in this particular set of images what's incredible is the size the size of these these clots some of the these can get quite big in size there you go <laughs> and um you can see like one of them looks like some sort of a monster head. It's really, really incredible. So obviously serious thing when we can have something that big clumped together floating in the blood. And the authors mentioned that clearly these clots can be very different in sizes that can vary per individual. And as a consequence, this might explain the variety of different symptoms that are being observed between between different long COVID individuals, okay? So, what else can I tell you about that? Um, clearly, I already mentioned before that the authors think that um, that um, this uh, this will be or, there you go. This will be causing. Um, reduction of oxygen supply to the tissues which they believe will then cause most of the symptoms and we need to start studying this in detail because we need to understand which symptoms are the primary symptoms in long covid versus those that would be secondary that are simply side effects of the primary symptoms so and then we need to know all that information in order to understand what kind of treatments we might have to be, be, be looking after because this might be a, a common problem. And obviously in terms of treatments, one of the things that was, I thought was interesting being mentioned by the authors was they mentioned that triple anticoagulation therapy might be a way to go. And they mentioned that in early observations and, um, I wasn't sure exactly um, whether that was their own studies or uh, another another 
group of scientists studies, early observations suggested that such an approach was um, capable of removing some of the symptoms uh, that long COVID patients were suffering. And another one that they mentioned, and we'll, we'll talk about this in a future video in greater detail, was perhaps uh, use of what they said hyperbaric oxygen in order to make sure that individuals can can um, get appropriate oxygen supply because to alleviate the fact that these cuts could be could be blocking oxygen distribution to tissues so mm, what else can i mention in terms of amyloidosis i think i'm probably covered all of the different topics let's see if we can track this one last guy all the other balloons are already on the horizon <laughs> they're gone they're gone yeah yeah i think that's um i captured all the information for you in terms of uh, amyloids i thought that's interesting that this abnormal behavior can be found in so many different diseases and yeah let's see let's see what happens now remember one more thing that in the next video i'll be talking about the spike protein being the potential trigger here in in formation of, of these uh, of these um, abnormal clots now what's interesting is that what are the triggers in formation of these abnormal clots outside of the spike protein is not fully known but what the authors mention is that you need very little tiny amount of trigger and they were able to observe before that they were able to trigger it with lipopolysaccharide which is highly immunogenic component of bacterial walls by immunogenic what i mean by that is that it can drastically stimulate immune system we talked about that before in one of our videos and as an example they mentioned that it only took one such molecule this lipopolysaccharide against 100 million fibrin molecules to start triggering these abnormal clots so incredible difference in terms of amounts so you might require a very tiny amount of starting material to get things going and that might also be the case for the spike protein and stay tuned to find out more about that in the upcoming videos on this topic okay i'm gonna wrap it up here so bye everyone thanks for hang out with me thanks for your support please subscribe please give us a like please join my patreon account as well where we post videos that do not make it to this channel and also please um, join our COVID-19 Q&A sessions and we will have one coming up dedicated to IgG4 antibodies alone just on that topic so something different so please check it out if you want a free ticket to that please subscribe to our newsletter the link to that to the to the newsletter subscription is in the description below and i'll see you later bye everyone